Okay, we're going to start uh, the sessions. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Global HR Forum of 2013 and for coming to this first special session of the forum. I'm Juyang Kim of Hyundai Research Institution. It's my great honor to serve as moderator in these sessions. This session is really a special session because we invited uh, the famous uh, Professor Francis Fukuyama this session. He is not only a world-famous scholar, but also a well-known author in Korea. He published many books, and also he is one of the most respected scholars in our ages. He wrote books in 1989, The, the End of History that has become the most famous book in the early ages. And then in 1992, he wrote another book, The End of the History and the Last Man. And then in 1995, the world famous best-selling book, The Trust, this comes out. And after that, he kept writing books the, in 1999, The Great Disruptions, and then after that, The Origins of Political Order and the many other books he wrote. And we all wrote in Korea, all known for Koreans well. Uh, currently, uh, Francis Fukuyama is uh, serving as Olivia Nomellini, Senior Fellow at the Stanford University for the International Studies. And his uh, educational background is very diverse. He studied uh, bachelor degrees in classics at the Cornell University, and then he got a master in literature uh, at the Yale University, and then he got a PhD in Harvard University. So he got a very diverse background in his uh, educational, uh, uh, or in his education. Uh, I think I do better to save time to hear his speeches rather than enumerating uh, pages along his resumes. Uh, before I invite him to the podium, I'd like to inform you about the time schedule of these sessions. Uh, Professor Fukuyama, he will deliver about uh, 45 to 50 minutes for speeches, and then we have uh, discussions about 20 to 30 minutes and then we'll have some time for the floor discussions about the 20 minutes at least. And then after that, if we have some more time, we'll have a photo session at, with Fukuyama as a very young adult and the students are willing to take a picture with him. So now, let's welcome Professor Francis Fukuyama to the podium with big proud. Uh, well, Mr. Kim, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Uh, I'm really delighted to be back here in Seoul. Uh, this is actually the third global HR forum that I've attended. And I've um, really been amazed at the uh, audience and the quality of participation at every one of these events that I've attended. And so I was very happy when I was invited back uh, again uh, this year. So the topic that I want to address today is the question of the future of the middle class, uh, the global middle class, both in developing countries and in already industrialized countries. The topic uh, of the forum as a whole this year is beyond walls. That is to say, trying to break down some of the divisions that characterize modern societies. One of those divisions is the division of social class, meaning the division between rich and poor. In many respects, uh, people thought that we were moving beyond these kinds of class issues uh, as we left the 20th century and that 
gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, race, that these kinds of divisions had overtaken uh, class as the major ways in which modern societies would be divided from each other. But I think that class, social class, socioeconomic class remains actually a critical issue for the health of both developing and developed societies. But the middle class affects the two parts of the world in very different ways. And I have both a positive, good story to tell about the rise of a global middle class, but also a somewhat frightening uh, and troubled story about the future of the middle class in societies that are already uh, industrialized. And so there's a little bit of good news and bad news. And the good news is, in fact, related to the bad news. Uh, so let me uh, begin by talking about the good news, which is the rise of a global middle class. Now, over the past two years, we have seen a lot of global instability. Uh, the Arab Spring began in January of 2011 with revolutions against authoritarian government uh, in Tunisia and in Egypt that then spread to many other parts of the Middle East. Earlier this year, you had protests emerging in Turkey, in Gezi Park in Istanbul, uh, where many people began to spontaneously uh, criticize the uh, government, uh, uh, the Islamist government uh, that, was that has been ruling Turkey. Uh, and in Brazil, this summer, there is the outbreak of, again, mass protests in Sao Paulo, uh, in Rio, in other Brazilian cities. And I would say that all of these phenomena had a common origin, which is the fact that they were all driven by a new, young, rising middle class. And in fact, one of the most important social phenomena around the world uh, over the past generation has been the creation of this kind of a, uh, of a new um, middle class. It stands to reason that this should happen. Since 1970, the global economy has quadrupled in size. It's four times larger than it was uh, 40 years ago. And with that increase has come a massive increase in the number of people that can be considered uh, middle class. And so Goldman Sachs um, estimated that by the year 2030, there would be uh, some 2 billion middle class people. There was another study by a research institute in the European Union uh, that estimated the middle class to already be 1.8 billion uh, in 2010 rising to 3.2 billion by 2020 and almost 5 billion by the year 2030. The African Development Bank has pointed to the remarkable growth in sub-Saharan Africa and has said that there are already 300 million middle class people uh, in Africa. Now, why is this important? It's important very politically uh, because the middle class um, behaves differently uh, than do the poor. The middle class, I think, almost universally have been the main drivers, not just of revolution and of social protest, but of political change more broadly. And one of the reasons that we have so much more democracy in the world in the year 2013 is that there has been a corresponding social revolution with the rise of these middle class uh, individuals. Democracy rests on a strong middle class, and I think the logic behind that uh, is very clear. Middle class people, uh, if you have a society that has a broad middle class that is not divided between a small oligarchy of extremely rich people and a mass of very poor people, that kind of, of a society can sustain democratic politics much more successfully uh, than one that is uh, highly unequal. In unequal societies, you have the tendency to populist politics, to sharp resentments uh, against the wealthy, to 
uh, outbreaks of violence and then the corresponding effort to suppress uh, that kind of upsurge. And therefore, I think that democracy has stabilized in many parts of the world uh, as a result of the growth of this middle class. Uh, and in fact, here in Korea, it, it's, it's actually a very good example of that. So you, uh, as a political order, democratized beginning in the late 1980s uh, as a result of social protests. And if you think about what happened to Korea in the generation preceding the opening to democracy, uh, this country went from a predominantly agricultural society to a predominantly urban industrial one in which there was a very large growing class of professionals, university students, uh, educated people, and they were critical to the broad social coalition that mobilized in 1987 to protest the military uh, government and to bring about the opening up of the Korean political system. And the fact that this country has successfully modernized economically, I think, is ultimately the guarantee that that kind of authoritarian politics uh, is very unlikely uh, to come back. A broad middle class is what creates trust and social capital. The last time that I was here in Korea, I lectured on the origins of trust. And we can discuss in, in the later discussion the degree to which contemporary Korea has trust or not. But let me tell you, one of the most corrosive uh, uh, things that undermines trust is sharp class divisions in which there is a large group of poor people or people without access uh, to wealth and power that believe that the elites are manipulating them uh, and hurting their interests behind their back. And so broad trust in the society really depends on a broad middle class. This is an observation that the philosopher Aristotle made uh, 2,500 years ago, uh, and I think that it uh, is true today. In 2013, there are probably uh, 110 to 120 electoral democracies around the world. In the year 1970, there were only 35 to 40. And so, again, that increase in the number of democracies uh, in the world is very much driven by uh, the, um, uh, the rise of the middle class. Now, there's an important issue that's related to the topic of this global HR forum, which has to do with how do you define middle class? Many economists uh, simply use a money definition. They either pick some absolute level of consumption or they say the middle class are the middle, let's say, three quintiles in the income distribution, the middle three-fifths of the income distribution. I actually think that this is a less useful, uh, either of these methods are less useful in characterizing the middle class from the standpoint of how the middle class is going to behave. And in fact, some of the large estimates that you see for the number of middle class people around the world, I think are using uh, too low a standard for uh, what constitutes middle class. A lot of those people, uh, especially the 300 million in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, or many in Latin America, are actually former poor people who have simply achieved a higher uh, slightly higher standard of living because of the global commodity boom over the past uh, 10 years, but are very vulnerable and will fall back into poverty uh, if there's a global downturn. And I think the, the better definition uh, of middle class status is really the one that's used by the sociologist. It has to do with occupational status, whether you're white collar or blue collar, whether you work in services or in manufacturing or in agriculture but most of all having to do with education because people that have an education and particularly people who have some degree of university education behave politically very, very differently than uh, people with lesser uh, uh, degrees. Uh, this is a point that was made by my former teacher, the great political scientist Samuel Huntington who pointed out that the most politically dangerous social group in any society were middle class individuals who had arrived at middle class status uh, in the past generation, but whose opportunities for advancement were blocked by their society in terms of getting a job, 
or participating in politics. And I think that this is exactly the phenomenon that we saw in the Arab Spring. The uprisings in Tunisia and the initial uprisings in Tahrir Square were driven by students, by young people, many of whom had some degree of university education. Uh, they were highly um, connected with the world. They were able to use technology. And in that respect, social media, uh, media like Twitter and Facebook, uh, were extremely important in both connecting them to each other and them to the outside world, to the larger trends that were going on outside of the Arab world. And it is that group of people that felt that the dictatorships of Ben Ali in Tunisia or Mubarak in uh, Egypt uh, were holding them back. And although uh, we, we can talk about the Arab Spring because in the two years since it broke out, it's evolved and now there are many other actors involved, the Muslim Brotherhood and Islamists uh, and so forth. But the initial uh, cutting edge of that social protest movement uh, were these middle class uh, were these middle class young people. One of the big challenges for global politics that I see around the world right now is to take the anger of these protest movements and translate that into durable political reform because one of the great limitations of, let's say, a Twitter uh, empowered generation is their failure to turn protest, uh, opposition to governments, to bad governments, and turn that into durable political reform. And it is not clear to me that technology by itself is sufficient to do that. Technology is very good at mobilizing people to get upset, to be angry, to bring down dictators. It is much less good at formulating uh, durable policies in gaining political power through a democratic uh, election process and then actually changing the nature of the political system so that it meets the needs of these new middle class uh, constituents. And that's the challenge and my worry about the world in a certain sense, despite the fact that I think this rising middle class is good for democracy and good for mass participation in politics, my worry is that that whole movement in the Arab world, in Brazil, in Turkey, in other places, uh, is simply going to dissipate because those activist young people that are now empowered are not going to figure out uh, how to turn uh, their energy into a more durable uh, political reform. Uh, there's a book uh, that came out by a friend of mine, Moises Naim, in um, this past year in the United States called The End of Power, in which he argues that there's a crisis in authority around the world because now you have all these highly empowered middle class people that are aware of what's going on. They have access to information about the wrongdoing, the corruption, uh, the incompetence of their governments, but there's nothing that can actually fix the problem. They can't take the next step uh, to actually change some of those problems. And if that's a situation that persists, persists uh, then I think we have some real problems. All right, now I'm going to turn next to the implications of a rising middle class for China. I just spent several days in China uh, before coming here to Seoul. I was in Beijing and in uh, Shanghai, and every time I go there, I am really impressed with uh, <laughs> both how monstrously big that country is and how successful, but also, uh, you know, it, it, it raises in my mind quite a number of worries uh, about the future, and obviously, as a neighbor of China, um, uh, Korea is one of the first countries that will be affected by developments there. So this middle class revolution is happening in China as we speak. China is not going to be exempt from this. So today, out of a population of 1.3 billion, uh, depending on, again, your definition, there's probably 400 million people in China that would qualify as being middle class. Now many, um, the Chinese government and, and, and apologists for the Chinese government uh, argue that the Chinese are different, they're more deferential to authority, they don't really like Western democracy as a foreign uh, import. Uh, I think actually the truth of the matter is that it is social change 
that is really going to affect the Chinese political order, and that's not a cultural issue, because I think that middle class people everywhere around the world behave in a similar manner. If you have a higher degree of education, and if you have uh, assets, you have a, a house or an apartment or even a car uh, or consumer durables that the government can take away, you have a much greater interest in what that government does. You want to participate. You don't want the government uh, taking things from you or harming your interests. Whereas if you're a poor peasant living uh, at the edge of starvation in the countryside, you're much more interested in simply providing food for your family rather than caring what the government is going to do to you. And this is the kind of middle class that now exists in a really, really big way uh, in China. This is the generation that uses Sino Weibo, their equivalent of Twitter. Uh, and just to give you an example of the kinds of political implications this has, consider the high-speed rail accident that took place a couple of years ago uh, near Weizhou, the city of Weizhou. So as you all know, China has invested several hundred billion dollars in building a beautiful high-speed rail network connecting all of its major cities. But one of these trains got into an accident. About 40 people were killed. And the first instinct of the railway ministry was to actually bury physically bury the cars so that nobody could see what happened and nobody could attribute any blame uh, for that accident. But all of these middle class Chinese using their cell phones took photographs of the cars and, the, and they're being buried. They put them up uh, on Weibo. The government tried to take them down, but it got out. Word got out. They could not prevent uh, knowledge of this from happening. And eventually the government was so embarrassed that they unburied the cars, they launched an investigation, uh, and actually in the past year they convicted and sentenced to death the railway minister that presided over uh, that, uh, that scandal. And so there's no formal accountability in China, but in some sense this combination of technology, social media, the ability to communicate, and more educated socially and politically aware people has been putting pressure already on the government of China to be more responsive. Uh, now, I don't have any illusions that this is going to lead to democracy in China uh, anytime uh, in the near future uh, for the following reason, that in some sense, the middle class in China actually, I think, overall is pretty supportive of the Communist Party and of the uh, authoritarian system uh, that they have in place. And actually, it, it makes sense uh, because they are the ones that are the main beneficiaries of that authoritarian system uh, up till now. And so why should they want to upset a regime that you know, has, has made them quite rich? The problem, I think, down the road for China is going to be the following, that China is going to slow down its rate of economic growth. This is inevitable. The Chinese plan to continue to expand for the next decade at 7% a year, but they are already a middle-income country seeking to move into high-income status. They are basically where Korea was back in the 1970s, and they want to move to 1990s Korea. And that transition for that large a country is extraordinarily hard. And so it seems to me it's almost inevitable that the growth rate, the, 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 the China model of growth uh, is going to face internal contradictions. You cannot simply grow by investing 50% of your GDP, uh, government-led investment every year, and, and have that uh, be sustainable. And the question, I think, that will lead to real political problems in China is what happens when that rate of growth slows down and when the employment opportunities for that new middle class uh, begin to shrink. Already, China produces about six to seven million new university graduates every single year. And their employment uh, prospects are worse than the prospects of their working class parents that move from the countryside into a factory in, 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 in Shenzhen or or uh, Jiangsu province or one of the big manufacturing centers in China. Uh, so 
the future of China will really depend on this interaction between the economic trajectory that uh, is likely to slow and the expectations of this rising middle class that uh, at the moment uh, likes the regime but in the future uh, may experience the same kind of anger uh, and um, uh, social protest that we've seen appear. And by the way, you should remember that in both Turkey and Israel, the, uh, I'm sorry, both Turkey and Brazil, these are both successful countries. They're both democratic countries that allowed free political participation, and they had both been growing very rapidly for emerging market countries over the previous decade, and that did not stop the emergence of this middle class protest. And so in China, you have, I think, the possibility of a similar kind of instability arising and coming out of nowhere, surprising everybody, uh, and then people will look back and say, why didn't we uh, anticipate this? Uh, so the Chinese government, I think, is riding something of a tiger. Uh, they're about to hold the third plenum of their communist uh, 18th uh, party congress uh, in the coming week. Uh, we'll see whether uh, they're actually up to the task of truly opening up uh, their society to freer information, to greater individual uh, opportunity, uh, or whether they want to maintain uh, state control. And in that decision, I think, will uh, ride very much the future stability of the country. Uh, I want to say a little bit about foreign policy because Frankly, uh, I am really worried about East Asia. <laughs> I'm really worried about East Asia uh, because I think that there has been a tremendous rise in nationalism uh, across the region, uh, and particularly in this part in, in Northeast Asia, particularly on the part of China, uh, Japan, and uh, to some extent, I think, here uh, in Korea as well. And I think in terms of the walls that we want to break down, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the countries in this region have been moving uh, to build up new walls uh, that I think will really uh, lead to a dangerous situation uh, down the road. And here again, I think the Chinese middle class is, is, is interesting because their attitudes are actually different, I think, in foreign policy than they are in domestic policy. So I think although many middle-class Chinese would like to see a freer and more open domestic uh, reformed uh, uh, system. Uh, I think they're actually more nationalistic than uh, their parents' generation uh, for a number of reasons. And it partly has to do with the role of the government because the government's own legitimacy depends on its ability to make the argument that they are the, um, you know, they're the, the, the source of, of, of uh, Chinese power and, and the protector of Chinese uh, national interest. Now, I don't want to <laughs> argue that China is particularly aggressive or following uh, uh, you know, a, a terribly militaristic uh, kind of policy in the disputes that it's gotten into with many of its neighbors in the past uh, few years. I actually think that what the Chinese want is dignity. They want the recognition that they're a historically great power and, in fact, the dominant power uh, in East Asia, and I think they simply want people to recognize that that is the case. In many respects, I think their ambitions are a lot like uh, the United States in the Western Hemisphere. The United States had this thing called the Monroe Doctrine in which we said that uh, the Americans said, we're the dominant power in the Western Hemisphere and other uh, countries should stay out. So I think this is simply something that uh, great powers uh, do. But it is colliding with other uh, assertive nationalisms, and particularly I think this extremely unfortunate uh, trend in Japan uh, to base um, the revival of Japan also, I think, on a historical narrative of the 20th century that I think uh, fails to take account of the real history that uh, occurred between Japan and its neighbors uh, in that time period. And so <laughs> uh, I just think that um, the situation that we face in East Asia right now, I, I in a way like to compare it to the one that occurred in Europe after the unification of Germany in the 1870s when Britain and France all of a sudden had to deal with a very large unified Germany in the middle of Europe that was growing much faster than they were. 
uh, and they didn't handle it well. And so next year uh, is going to mark the 100th anniversary uh, of the start of the Great War, uh, World War I. Uh, it was a war that basically undermined uh, European civilization, uh, and I think it was actually an avoidable war. Uh, if German power had been better accommodated by the existing um, international system, I think that that conflict, that disastrous conflict, uh, could have been avoided. And I think one of the uh, tasks in this region is to prevent uh, a similar uh, kind of conflict from arising. All right, so I'm now done with the developing world, and I'm going to move on to the developed world. And this is the part of the story that is less happy. Uh, so as I said, the rise of a global middle class has provided the social basis for democracy in many developing countries. But in already developed industrialized countries, I think the impact is the opposite. Uh, that the middle class, or not the impact, the, the, the reality, the socioeconomic reality is very different. And that has to do with the decline of the incomes of people who thought they were middle class and a growing degree of economic inequality uh, across the um, uh, across virtually the entire uh, uh, developed world. This is a universal phenomenon that is more powerful in some countries like my own, like the United States, uh, than in others, but hardly anyone uh, is exempt from this. And I think we're quite familiar with the causes of this growing inequality. So the one that everybody blames first is globalization. Uh, obviously, globalization has dumped hundreds of millions of new low-skilled workers on the global job market so that uh, manufacturing can be outsourced uh, to uh, new and, and, and lower labor cost uh, areas. But the single underlying driver of this really uh, is technological change. It's more technological change than globalization. One of the realities of the information and communications revolution is the replacement, the, the ability of machines, of intelligent machines, to replace varying levels of low-skill labor uh, across the board. And you see this relentless process going on everywhere. Just to take an example, um, these days I don't buy books in bookstores because, quite frankly, I can't find any physical bookstores in, uh, you know, around Stanford University any, anymore. They're all closing as of all the record stores and, and so forth. So we now buy e-books. Uh, and if you think about what that's done to the labor market, uh, under the old system where you bought a physical book, uh, you had an author, uh, a publisher, and then a large distribution system. And so you had to print the books, you had to ship the books to warehouses, you had to take the books from warehouses to retail stores, you needed retail clerks, and that entire value chain produced a large number of medium to low skill uh, jobs for um, a lot of people that were not the writers of the books uh, or even necessarily the consumers of the books, but all the people that got the book from the writer to the, uh, the final consumer. All of that's gone now. Today, I hit a button, I download an ebook uh, from Amazon into my Kindle, uh, and all of those middle, middle men uh, and, and, and middle women uh, have been uh, uh, removed from the value chain. And that is something that is going on uh, across the world. And so through public policy, countries can slow that process, but everybody in the end has to uh, deal with uh, its consequences. Uh, and I think that this is fueling a, a great deal of populist politics and anger uh, across the developing uh, world. And by the way, even when manufacturing uh, returns as it's been doing in the United States, uh, it is not creating a lot of jobs because manufacturing these days is so high tech that work that was done by uh, tens of thousands of workers is now done by industrial robots and all of the rewards are going to the people who design the robots, not the people uh, necessarily that, um, uh, that operate them. So the question for our politics is how we uh, deal with this uh, uh, how we deal with this change. And I think you can see the beginnings of, you know, much larger instability. I mean, you see it already in the United States where, uh, you know, the, the statistics on income inequality are really quite uh, uh, dramatic. Uh, 
uh, we're familiar with the top 1% of the income distribution, which in 1970 uh, took home about 7 or 8% of GDP, uh, that by 2008 was taking home around 24%. Even beyond that, within that, ten, well, within that top 1%, the top 10% of, uh, uh, of the 10%, that is the top hundredth of the income distribution, earns almost 10% of U.S. national income. Uh, and so the concentration of wealth uh, at the top uh, is really extraordinary. Even in Scandinavia, with its big welfare state, social, democra social democratic welfare states, uh, there's been a rather dramatic increase in uh, inequality, uh, particularly before uh, taxes and transfers, again, because everybody is dealing with the same uh, problem. And this is what's leading to a lack of trust in elites. The Tea Party in the United States, if you listen to their rhetoric, uh, it is all about elites that have betrayed ordinary uh, uh, Americans. If you listen to the anti-immigrant, anti-European populist parties uh, in uh, Europe uh, that have sprung up in many, many European countries, uh, again, it is a conspiracy by elites uh, to undermine the livelihoods of ordinary uh, French people, you know, Brits, uh, uh, Italians, and, and, and so forth. And this, if our recovery does not pick up steam, is going to be a much bigger problem uh, for the politics of all of our countries. All right, so I want to now move on to what I think are some uh, policy responses and solutions. So I think that the disappearance of the middle class in the industrialized world, since it is actually driven by large uh, social and technological forces is not something that we can wish away and, and, and there may not actually be uh, good responses. But in all of these cases, uh, I think that there are certain things that we can do. So I'm going to talk about three uh, different areas. I'm going to talk about some ways of bringing down walls with regard to uh, first education, uh, then with regard to uh, how governments ought to behave, and finally, uh, in terms of international relations. So let me begin with the question of education, since this is really the subject of this global uh, human resources forum. Uh, every economist <laughs> has been telling us for decades that the solution to this problem of technological change uh, is more education, that you have to keep moving uh, people up the uh, value chain. They have to move into higher skill categories in order to remain uh, competitive in this extremely competitive global environment. And I think that's probably one of the premises of holding a global HR forum uh, of this sort, is to figure out how to do that. But I think that in many respects, the, the way that we interpret what that means, uh, uh, we can get wrong. And I think that in certain societies uh, here in Korea, and I think also in my own country in the United States, we've interpreted that as investing in high-end elite education uh, as opposed to uh, a broader kind of educational agenda that deals with other parts of the population. And I think that that, uh, in many respects, may be um, uh, actually contributing to the skewing of income distribution and, and the growing inequality in our society. Uh, for example, uh, here in Korea, by 2008, 84% of young Koreans were attending uh, universities. And in fact, the uh, Economist uh, a couple of weeks ago in a special uh, issue on uh, the Koreas described what's going on in Korea uh, as an educational arms race. Uh, and I think the problem, you know, you can see also in, in, uh, in, in the United States, uh, today there is something on the order of $1.2 trillion in accumulated student debt held by individual Americans uh, to pay for their college educations. This amount of debt is larger than the subprime, the, the accumulated debt in the, uh, in the subprime housing market that triggered the uh, collapse of the financial system uh, in 2007 and 2008. All of these individuals are taking out all of this debt under the view that if they get a four-year college education, 
they will get a job and that job will pay off and allow them to pay down not just that debt but move into uh, a secure middle class life. And I am not sure that that is actually, that that story is actually going to pan out. And there are in fact many fears that that debt student debt market is actually going to collapse because those students are ultimately not going to be able to pay those loans back. That they will not get the kinds of employment that they had been told uh, to expect as a result of making those um, investments in education. I think both Korea and the United States emphasize the high end uh, of the education market. So we Americans love Stanford, my own university, or Harvard, or MIT, or all of those elite uh, uh, universities, and we spend a tremendous amount of time competing to get in. Uh, so Stanford, for example, in the, 19, in the early 1960s, it admitted 50% of all the students that applied to it. Now it admits about 5%, a much, much smaller fraction. The total number of students uh, at Stanford hasn't increased, and so the value of getting into Stanford has exploded. It's increased, uh, you know, tenfold. Uh, and these are what economists call positional goods. Uh, they're not absolute goods. If I get into Stanford, somebody else doesn't get into Stanford. Uh, and so net, you know, there's no benefit to the society that we both spend uh, a huge amount of money with tutoring and private schools and uh, knocking ourselves out to get that position. The position itself uh, is very valuable. And in fact, the more valuable elite education becomes, the more elite it gets because more smart people go to Stanford or Harvard or Seoul National University or Yonsei or whatever, uh, but the, ult you know, the, the, the uh, ultimate supply uh, doesn't uh, expand. Uh, and therefore, I think it leads to something of a misallocation uh, of educational resources, both on the part of governments and on the part of private uh, individuals. Uh, I think, actually, that if you want to seriously deal with the broad problem of the declining middle class and middle class uh, uh, incomes, uh, you really need to spend uh, time working on the lower tiers of the educational system, on vocational uh, education, in training, uh, in community colleges, in uh, a second and third ranked uh, university system that actually is the place where the vast bulk of people going into uh, businesses uh, need to get their training. And in that respect, uh, there has been a really big problem because a number of our countries have underinvested in this type of uh, education. Uh, in fact, uh, in, in, in the United States, I think this is a particular problem where the competitiveness of getting into a four-year school has really uh, starved, uh, in, in many respects, uh, um, state universities and vocational schools of a lot of the resources uh, that they can use. Incidentally, uh, this emphasis on high-end education, these four-year, expensive four-year degrees is contributing, among other things, to the collapse of fertility uh, in Asia and in other parts of the world uh, where governments do not fund uh, a great deal of, of um, education and where that's left up to private individuals. The marginal cost of having another child in Japan, in Korea, in Taiwan, in Singapore, is prohibitive, and so many parents decide not to have that extra child simply because they don't see a way of affording uh, a good um, university uh, education. And I think actually, uh, you know, you're <laughs> the whole of East Asia is facing a demographic crisis of very, very large proportions over the next generation, where total fertility rates here in Singapore, in Taiwan, in Japan, uh, and soon to be in China as well, uh, have fallen way below replacement rates. And so you're going to face a uh, demographic bulge as these populations get older that is going to be extremely hard to uh, fund in terms of health care and pensions and the like. And I think the reason for that really has to do with education, that the moment that women uh, start re uh, achieve, um, receiving uh, education equal to men, they don't want to live in traditional families and they don't want to play traditional social roles. And there's actually a correlation between uh, developed countries with good educational systems uh, that are socially conservative and low fertility. So in Europe, 
The lowest fertility countries are the Catholic countries in Southern Europe, Spain, uh, Italy, uh, uh, and the like. And actually, uh, uh, in, in an interesting way, the highest fertility countries are now the more progressive social democratic countries in uh, Scandinavia. So Sweden now actually has a total fertility rate uh, that's gotten back above uh, two. And part of the reason for that is that there's been a, an adjustment in social uh, attitudes that allows women uh, to work and to raise families uh, at the same time. Uh, and therefore, they're more willing to have children. Uh, and so I think you know, there's a, the educational component is, uh, uh, is critical in that uh, looming crisis uh, as well. All right, uh, I'm going to finish up. So that's it for education. I think that bringing down walls uh, includes bringing down walls within the compartments that we, uh, we use in our education policy. Second uh, set of walls that needs to be brought down uh, has to do uh, with uh, governments. Governments have to be more effective. They have to deliver actual goods, education, health, security, uh, uh, efficient uh, 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 public goods uh, in ways that citizens uh, that respond to the actual needs uh, of citizens. And they have not been doing that in very many uh, countries, in very many democracies. Democracies are supposed to be uh, they're supposed to be accountable. They're supposed to do what citizens want. And yet, in many of our modern democracies, including in the United States, people are losing trust in those democratic systems. Political parties seem more interested in simply produce, uh, reproducing themselves or maintaining their position than actually solving uh, problems that their citizens uh, demand. Electoral cycles don't really correspond to the kinds of short-term needs that, that citizens uh, have. Voters are not presented with real choices. They're presented with phony choices that the politicians uh, cook up. Uh, and bureau bureaucracies are distant. They're unresponsive. Uh, citizens don't have a way of actually giving input into the way that uh, their governments uh, act. And so there needs to be a very different, I think, attitude towards government where Government is not um, a group of experts that live in some Olympian region and deliver uh, proper policies based on a formal system of democratic accountability. There needs to be a much more responsive and reactive cycle between citizens and their governments. Not that citizens by themselves can run uh, governments, but it is that interaction between a bottom-up civil society and the government that will determine how responsive and how accountable uh, that government uh, actually is. There needs to be new um, models of accountability in which the long route of electoral accountability that we've built in our modern democracies, which is still important, it's still important, but that is not enough for modern governments. Modern governments need to figure out how to get closer to people and how to offload a lot of the, the, the actual uh, work of governing onto civil society, onto partnerships, to co-opt the abilities and skills and knowledge that exist uh, in uh, our societies. Uh, and so that uh, is another set of critical reforms. The final uh, set of, of issues, I would say, just in terms of breaking down walls, has to do with international uh, relations. So as I said, I'm really worried about this part of the world because I see this very uh, dangerous rise of nationalism uh, in many uh, countries here. Uh, there are quite a lot of, I would characterize them as weak multilateral institutions uh, in East Asia. So you have, the, you have ASEAN, you have the ASEAN Regional Forum, APEC, uh, the East Asian Summit, uh, and the like, and I'm not sure that we need to multiply more of these multilateral uh, fora, but there's a set of issues, you know, having now uh, that have arisen uh, in the last four years having to do with uh, a whole range of territorial disputes between uh, different countries in East Asia, and I can't really think of any of them that wouldn't be better dealt with in a multilateral setting uh, rather than simply as a uh, bilateral matter. In fact, it's mostly the Chinese that are pushing to deal with all of these things on a, on a bilateral basis. 
But I think that what the region and the world needs when you have a territorial uh, dispute is a universal set of rules that apply not just to the particular uh, case uh, in point, but are general rules that will apply to territorial disputes more broadly. And that's something that can really only be uh, negotiated on uh, a multilateral basis. Uh, so this, I think, is uh, a set of uh, suggestions for how to break down walls. Uh, I think the world is half <laughs> half moving in a very, very good direction with the rise of this global middle class, with greater education, with greater opportunity, but governments are failing uh, to keep up. And simply the fact that you have a democratic government that exists under some rules of formal accountability does not mean that your population is going to regard you as legitimate or effective. Legitimacy depends not just on the principle of democracy, it depends on performance. And if uh, our governments cannot learn to be more effective and if they do not deliver more of the things that people want, including uh, some ways of dealing with this, this crisis of the erosion of, of middle class incomes, uh, then they're not going to be regarded as legitimate uh, down the road. So there's a big, um, there's a big agenda ahead of us and uh, uh, so I would like to, I'll, I'll stop talking now and begin our discussion. Thank you uh, very much for your uh, attention. Uh, you better turn on the mic. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for your comprehensive and illuminating insight about our future society. You pointed out very critical and important issues, the rise of global middle class in the developing world and also the, the decline in the developing world, developed world. Uh, and then the future of China as well as other developed world or country will depend on how to deal or respond to what the middle class demands. Uh, okay, before we have Q&A and uh, discussions. I wonder how do you want to be described as like a political economist or political scientist or futurist or, or the, a philosopher? In Korean newspaper, you, they are describing many different words about you. How about uh, you? Well, I'm a political scientist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm not a futurist because I have no idea what the future is going to, what's gonna happen in the future. Uh, and uh, I, I do think that, you know, political economy is, is really what I've been thinking about because I don't think you can think about the economy in isolation from politics. Uh, I'm definitely not a philosopher. I'm not that smart, so. Um. Well, we have many topics to be discussed further. The first going to be the, about the rising educated middle class in China. As we, for us, the the China is very sensitive with the, uh, how they're gonna go in the future. So, as you said, even though the China middle class is, is not anti-racism right now, and also shares some common values like a sinocentrism and also nationalism, but we can see some revolutionary movement uh, is happening in, in China also. So I think the China government is riding tiger. Uh, they cannot stop the growing middle class in their country. Do you think the China government can open up and control the liberalization and democratization process smoothly in the future? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's really the critical question that Xi Jinping and the Chinese leadership, this new Chinese leadership, are trying to deal with because I think that there's probably a faction within the Communist Party that would like to open up the system to liberalize. That's certainly what a lot of middle class Chinese would prefer. Uh, almost all of my friends in China, you know, would like an end to this kind of petty censorship. They'd be able to use the internet, you know, more freely, get on Facebook, you know, do all of these things that people in other countries do. Uh, and to be able to talk among themselves and to have a, you know, a media that actually uh, reflected real uh, 
public opinion. Uh, and I think that what the current leadership worries about is the precedent of Mikhail Gorbachev. You know, Gorbachev promoted uh, glasnost, which is this kind of liberalization, uh, and perestroika, which is reform. The Chinese have chosen to do the reform, but without any glasnost. And I think what they're worried is that if you start opening up the system, uh, you're going to generate criticism and opposition, and then they're going to lose control of China the way Gorbachev lost control of uh, the former Soviet Union. Uh, the problem is that they may be exactly wrong about this. You know, that it, it may be the case that right now there's enough goodwill in the system that they actually not only could open it up more, but they need to open it up more because that's what's going to buy them some time and some legitimacy uh, so that they will uh, survive and that if they simply try to repress um, that desire for greater freedom, uh, it's not going to go away. It's just going to you know, it's going to stay there and it's going to smolder and get bigger and then it'll, you know, explode uh, at a later point and it'll be much more uh, dangerous. And so I think you could argue uh, either of these strategies right now if you wanted to maintain uh, stability in China. Oh, okay, thank you. Well, in, in China, there's uh, some other issues. In China, as we know, they have uh, about the 50 minority societies. The middle class in that society will also expect it to grow in the future. Mm -hmm. So we, we are wondering whether China can still handle them well as they did with the middle class of Han tribe. Uh, on that one, I think that the Chinese government uh, will probably be able to preserve the unity of the country because unfortunately this is an area where I think most uh, Chinese, Han Chinese, who are liberal on domestic political issues, uh, <laughs> there's no uh, support for, you know, greater freedom for ethnic minorities in, in, in China. Uh, this is actually an issue I've found repeatedly where uh, people are on the government side 100% with regard to, you know, Taiwan having to come back, no independence or autonomy for, for uh, Tibet, uh, you know, very tight control over Central Asia. I don't see any, any uh, real separation between the, the views of, of kind of reformists in China and the government on uh, this particular issue. And, you know, because China is 90% ethnic Han Chinese, I think that unlike the Soviet Union, uh, the middle classes in these um, ethnic regions really don't have enough uh, political weight to really uh, destabilize the system. In the former Soviet Union, uh, you know, the Russians actually were a bare majority within, uh, within the former Soviet Union, but that's, uh, that's just not the case in China. Okay, thank you, thank you. Well, you didn't mention in your speech about uh, Japan, so some people uh, have worried about the Japanese remilitarizations. However, I believe that if Japan is advanced courage, a society and, and also highly intelligent uh, as a country. To me, currently Japan is utilizing the idea of remilitarization to divert the people's growing discontent to the other side. So do you think Japan is really serious enough to go war or some, some conflict with uh, neighboring countries like uh, China? So <laughs> this is... Uh, you know, I, I find it very difficult to talk about a lot of these issues because I have friends in China and Korea and Japan, <laughs> and whatever I say in one country gets reported in the other countries and, and oftentimes uh, misinterpreted. Uh, so I think that J in Japan, uh, you know, there is a pretty strong consensus in favor of the uh, post-war constitution that the country has not changed dramatically uh, in terms of attitudes, but there is this right nationalist right wing uh, in Japan that probably constitutes, I don't know, 15% of the public, but they happen to be very powerful uh, within the LDP, within the ruling party, and they happen to be represented by the current uh, prime minister. And in my dealings with these people, uh, they've got this very bizarre narrative of the 20th century, which, you know, and, and unlike the Germans, I think, 
this group of, of Japanese nationalists has really not come to terms with, you know, with, 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 with that history. Uh, and I think it's something that they, they really need to do. Uh, now, I'm not worried that, you know, I, so one of my big worries right now, I, I think that Prime Minister uh, uh, Abe uh, has done really good things in terms of his efforts to reform the Japanese economy. It will do everybody good if Japan can start growing uh, again. Uh, at the moment, he's put off the, uh, the agenda of revising Article 9 of the Constitution mm -hmm. that will allow uh, Japan to uh, build out its, uh, its military. Uh, my understanding is that he still wants to do so. <laughs> and I think that uh, Japan's uh, friends, including and especially the United States, you know, really need to tell him, quite frankly, that this is not a good this is not a good use of his political capital. Uh, that, uh, you know, there is a real defense problem, I think, uh, in East Asia, but it does not require this step of constitutional mm -hmm. uh, uh, revision. Uh, and in fact, you know, I mean, this is what I've told all of my Japanese friends, is that what J Japan needs right now is it needs all the friends it can get. And uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of its policies have mm -hmm. alienated mm -hmm. uh, natural friends. Uh, that uh, could be useful in, in, in some of these disputes and uh, certainly have given the Chinese you know, an opportunity to you know, use this as a, as a point of leverage against them. So I guess my, my hope is that uh, they will focus on just this task of economic reform and economic uh, reconstruction uh, uh, and, and, and stay away from uh, you know, this kind of a, a, a move in foreign policy. Well, we expect that Japan is behaving like as restrictive and as a global leader countries. Well, and the other thing is Japan, I mean, this is why I was saying in the last part of my talk, mm -hmm. this is why I think we actually need more kinds of multilateral structures mm -hmm. in East Asia, because all of the countries in this region, if they just go by themselves, it's going to be a disaster. They're, they're too powerful. They've got too many clashing interests. And so you need a set of agreements and understandings and norms so that people you know, know how to expect, you know, what to expect out of each other's uh, behavior. So in that respect, I think that despite the proliferation of all these organizations out here, uh, there's still a kind of under-institutionalization of multilateral structures to deal with the really difficult, serious problems that exist. Oh, our concern goes on for starting from China and Japan as now we're going up to North Korea. As in 19, uh, I, in the 2005 in June at, at, at the one seminar in Johns Hopkins University, you mentioned about the collapse of North Korea because of uh, uh, the lack of uh, legitimacy and uh, also human rights abuse. But do you think it still uh, is, uh, has some possibility of uh, perhaps uh, a new government with Kim Jong-un? Okay. <laughs> so I have to correct what you said a little bit. So uh, I confidently predicted in the early 1990s that North Korea would collapse. And here we are in 2013, and it's still there. So I think that proves that I don't know anything about the future of North Korea. Uh, I don't think that I said in, in the mid-2000s that North Korea would collapse. All I was arguing was that North Korea could collapse suddenly and unexpectedly. Um, and if it did, we needed to be better prepared than we are right now. Yes, well. uh, Because at the moment, if that regime were to, you know, there's an internal conflict within the ruling group and, you know, people shoot each other and, and there's a general state collapse. Uh, that's a really dangerous situation. China is going to be watching very carefully what South Korea does. You know, if, uh, if, if UN forces are introduced north of the 38th parallel, that can lead to an extremely uh, dangerous situation with China. And we don't have any uh, understandings among all the different parties as to, you know, uh, what's going to happen. Furthermore, there is this issue that I think that one thing that hasn't been explored with regard to North Korea is whether there's a way to incentivize China 
to back off from its support for North Korea by coming to an understanding of what the future of the U.S.-Korean alliance would be under a unified Korea. Right? The reason that the Chinese don't want to let go of North Korea is they don't want a unified Korea under uh, South Korean um, hegemony linked to the United States the way Germany unified and stayed in mm -hmm. NATO. Okay? Yeah. And you know, that's the kind of issue that I think could be discussed uh, now. Uh, okay, yes. Well, there is some progress about the resuming six-party talk yeah. uh, between the neighboring countries. So we'll, we'll see. Uh, what's going to happen in the future? Well, we we are also concerned about the uh, Arabian countries. We easily expect, as you said, the educated middle class will will also increase among the the Muslim countries. In that case, well, we are worrying about what will happen to such a transnational uh, terrorist organization like Al Qaeda. Is there going to be any changes, or are they going to continue to that kind of behavior? Well, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, I think that this social basis for continuing, you know, radical jihadism is, is still there and it's getting worse. Uh, I think that this is going to be one of the big consequences of, of this unresolved conflict in Syria. Uh, I think that this Syrian civil war is likely to go on for several more years uh, because I don't really see how the external players are really going to bring about a resolution, and as it goes on, more and more people get killed, more people get radicalized, and what's beginning to happen now is that that Sunni-Shia uh, conflict mm -hmm. is now spreading, it's spreading back into Iraq, it's spreading into the Persian Gulf, uh, it's kind of a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and, uh, and Iran, and, uh, and that's not a good thing. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's really going to, um, you know, some people have said that this may be, be the beginning of a kind of 30 years religious mm. war driven mostly by this sectarian conflict between Sunni and, and, and Shia. Uh, and so that, I think, is going to continue to f fuel um, this kind of terrorist uh, radicalism. Okay. Let's move on some issues about the European countries. In southern countries of Europe, the rising inequality and stagnation of the, the economic growth was a serious problem. So I su suspect that in, in southern and Europe, the more like uh, violent version of Occupy Wall Street could happen. So I wonder, how do you expect the future of the, the European countries? Uh, well, obviously, Greece uh, faces that danger. They've got this party, this new party called Golden Dawn that has been involved in quite a few uh, violent outbreaks. I'm actually surprised that there isn't more of this given how awful Greece's situation has been uh, over the past, um, uh, past five years. But I think Greece in itself, I, I, I suspect that Greece is going to muddle along uh, despite uh, those, those pressures. What I think is much more troubling is the spread of populist anti-immigrant parties in mm -hmm. Northern Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, Northern Europe, as you know, has been doing much better than Southern Europe. Yes. Uh, nonetheless, every single Scandinavian country now has a right-wing populist uh, party. There's a powerful one uh, in, in the Netherlands. Uh, you now have this um, UK independence party that's sprung up uh, uh, opposing uh, British membership uh, in the EU. And in all of those cases, the issue is not it, it's driven by, I think, this middle-class fear of being displaced by immigrants and by um, dealing with elites that have put them into a European Union that they didn't really approve and they don't like and are very uh, distrustful of. Uh, and so I think actually the, the greater uh, threat may actually be in the more successful countries rather than in southern Europe. Well, as you said, in the end of history, the mothers of democratic capitalism as going to be end of history or do you see any <laughs> other stage evolving to to the future um, so i think that uh, there isn't a viable alternative model to some combination of liberal democracy and and a market-based economy uh, the big one that everyone talks about is the china model uh, and for a whole variety of reasons, I don't think the China model uh, is 
first of all, I don't think the China model itself is sustainable mm -hmm. uh, for reasons that I indicated. I think that because of the lack of accountability in the political system, there's a lot of resentment and anger and problems that are building up. Uh, and I, since I also don't think the economic model is, is sustainable either, I think the combination of a slowing economy and these kinds of political pressures will, it won't cause China to democratize, but it will make it look like a much less uh, successful uh, society. Um, and furthermore, I don't think that the China model is one that can be exported to other mm. countries. Uh, in some sense, uh, you know, Japan and Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, they all benefit from a common, you know, Confucian Chinese historical legacy of strong state, you know, strong national identity, bureaucracy, uh, uh, this sort of thing. But the particular form of authoritarian government that exists in China now, I think only the Chinese can do this. I mean, uh, uh, you know, you can't do it in Africa, you can't do it in the Middle East. And so I don't think it's an alternative model that other countries can, uh, can readily follow. And I don't think any country that's in Asia, like Japan or Korea, that's already a democracy, mm. is ever going to consider reverting to a, you know, kind of Chinese authoritarianism. So I still believe that, uh, in fact, there really is only, you know, kind of one broad model. Uh, having said that, I think that democracies can decay. Uh, I'm going to publish a book next year, which will be the second volume uh, of my political order book. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, a lot of that book is about political decay, because I think in the United States, for example, that a number of our uh, institutions have, uh, have decayed. So I think that's really the threat. It's not that there's an alternative model out there. It's that you know, we're not doing a very good job in making our own systems work effectively. Well, even in, if we look at the European country, the, they studied almost the same models of democratic uh, capitalism, but uh, the, the result is a lot different. German and Sweden and in those northern countries are doing is good, yes. but the southern countries uh, is, is not doing good. So is that the, the German model going to be the future model for the, to evolve? evolve? Well, the German model is actually very interesting, and actually it's interesting with regard to the topic of this global HR uh, forum, because if you look in international rankings, German universities don't do very well. I mean, they've got a very small number of universities in the top, you know, 50 uh, of globally ranked uh, universities, but where they do much better is in uh, training, vocational training for their working class. Uh, and so it's partly that they've got this apprenticeship system and a tracking system that, that uh, puts um, a lot of working class young people into much more serious training to be machinists or welders or retail clerks or so forth. But there's, a, there's an important issue about dignity uh, that I think is important, that a working class, a skilled worker in Germany has much greater social prestige and recognition mm -hmm. than somebody like that, I think, in, in Korea or in the United States. Uh, in the United States, I, I won't speak for Korea, but I, I can speak for my own country. You know, if you're a welder in the United States or a machinist, uh, you know, you have no social prestige, uh, particularly. You don't have uh, formalized uh, training. And people who go to a vocational school are regarded by their peers as people who fail to make it to a four-year university. And so you're immediately looked down upon. Whereas the Germans, I think, have a very different attitude where mm. they say, okay, there's not everybody is going to go to university, but that doesn't mean that these skills are not extremely valuable and that we won't recognize them uh, as a society. And so if you become a retail clerk, you get training and then you get a diploma that says, you know, I've completed this training as a, as a retail clerk. In the United States, if you go to work for Walmart, they give you two days of training, just throw you on the floor, and, and then you <laughs> fire you, you know, the moment that you're not needed anymore. And so I think that you know, there is something in that German system that mm. deals directly with this question of middle class, uh, 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 not just incomes, but also the question of dignity. Uh, 
for the work for, for that kind of person. Well, we think we might have special session in next year about German education. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, it's going to be a good topic. Okay, now move on the the social capital. You uh, you among the, your book, the the world best selling book is I think is trust. So that was comes out in 1995. Even at that time, the trust was not that much uh, important uh, issues in Korea. But recently, it became very important uh, to our society. And in your books in trust, uh, you classified Korea with Italy, uh, France, <laughs> and China to be as a low trust society. So I wonder, it has been almost 20 years ago, but do you think still we have low trust society? Yeah, I should uh, probably explain a little bit. So what I was talking about there was the fact that um, in Korea, there were very powerful uh, family ties, uh, and most businesses had centered around families, but that historically uh, it was harder to establish trust relationships uh, outside of the family, and in some respects that was reinforced by the fact that you had a very powerful authoritarian uh, state that, you know, did not necessarily have a lot of popular legitimacy uh, and, 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 and so forth, and that led to a problem in uh, trust so that compared to Japan where it was relatively easy to recruit uh, somebody that wasn't a family member to run a family business, it was harder to do that in, in Korea. So that's really what I was uh, talking about. But I think in fairness, Korea has a lot of advantages that uh, other countries don't have that are a source of trust. And so, uh, you know, one of them is just uh, homogeneity mm. uh, that although there are regional differences in Korea that can sometimes be quite acute, uh, they're not the kind of ethnic, uh, you know, religious, uh, 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 racial uh, divisions that exist in, in, in many other societies. There's a very strong sense of Korean national identity that's, I think, shared across really the whole population. Uh, and in fact, that may be something of a problem because I think that one of the only ways that countries can deal with uh, you know, these collapsing populations is by immigration. <laughs> and if you're too homogeneous, you know, it, it makes immigration very difficult. The same problem exists in, 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 in Japan uh, as, as, as well. Uh, so that's a source of internal, uh, that's a source of internal trust. Uh, and I think finally, a lot of trust is actually something that governments can control if they operate in a way that, that is effective and that people see uh, as effective. Uh, and so in that respect, you know, the shift from an authoritarian government to a democratic one was a big step forward, but you still have big problems in terms of the, you know, the bitterness of the party competition within uh, Korea. And I think that to the extent that that system matures as a democratic system and really, you know, is seen as delivering, you know, good uh, benefits that's that's going to you know lead to an increase in in, in the general uh, levels of trust in the society. Is there any suggestion to Koreans to improve or uh, that kind of issues on the pol political front? <laughs> yeah, well, as a political scientist, I could come up with a lot of suggestions for how to tinker with your constitution. Uh, you know, like you could align the the congressional and the presidential voting cycles, and actually I think presidentialism is a little bit, I think parliamentary systems in a lot of ways work mm -hmm. better than presidential ones for a variety of reasons. Uh, I'm not sure in the end that any of those would fundamentally change the equation though, because part of the problem is just the process of democratic competition, which breeds uh, you know, politicians that invent issues even when there aren't really you know, issues. And so um, it's also partly a matter of, of political culture, I think, that, that is, needs to change if you're going to increase levels of trust. And for that, I don't really have any good suggestions for you. Oh, thank you. Uh, the, this is going to be the last discussion topics. Uh, in 1989, you wrote the book, The End of History. And that 
in that book, you predicted the termination of Cold War. And uh, as you predicted, the USSR were to perish after that. So I wonder, in this Global HR Forum, do you have something to say to us about <laughs> the probable future happenings in the history? Well, um, <laughs> yes, I've been asked this question before. Uh, um, I, I wasn't predict, I d it's not correct that I was predicting the, f the, the, f the fall of the Berlin Wall or the collapse of communism. What I did was, before it collapsed, I pointed out that there was this interesting global trend towards greater democracy uh, around the world. And I actually had no idea that the Berlin Wall would fall when it did or the Soviet Union would collapse uh, or anything uh, of the sort. And in fact, you know, as I said, we've gone from about 35, 40 democracies to over 100 uh, in the generation uh, since that happened. Uh, and I think that, you know, in that respect, I don't see any big changes. I, like, I don't think that we're all going to look like China in another 50 years. I think China is going to look more like Korea or, you know, Japan uh, in that period of time. Uh, what I think is much harder to predict is whether democracies themselves are not going to deteriorate because they are too rigid, unable to adapt, uh, you know, too set in a certain set of fixed ideas mm -hmm. uh, and, and actually captured by powerful special interests that want to use the, the system for their own purposes. I think that's the danger that uh, all of us face. I think in the United States you already see, you know, some evidence that, that this sort of thing is happening in, uh, in the political system. And so I think it's perfectly possible that in another 50 years, you know, democracy will still be the only game in town, but, you know, none of those democracies will be working uh, terribly well. So I think it's uh, something that we have to keep um, in mind that we don't, history isn't this ratchet that only turns in one direction and it mm. never turns backwards. Mm. I think it's, uh, it's perfectly capable of turning in the other direction as well. Well, thank you for your uh, long and extensive discussions and sincere uh, sit -wise, uh, well, answers and questions. Now it is time to, to, to the floors, to pro audience to have discussions. And we have about 10 to 15 minutes to discuss, so I can take uh, four to five questions. At each time, we'll take two questions, and then uh, the Professor Kuyama will answer and then go around the second round. Okay, if you have a question, raise your hand and please let us know your name and operations. And then please make short and clear your question. Okay, is there any microphones? Go to that one first. And then second one is uh, this one. Uh, uh, thank yeah. Thank you, Professor Kiyama. Uh, my name is Pung Gunjang from uh, GSIS, Seoul National uh, University. Well, uh, you may know that the world is busy preparing for the post-2015 agenda setting. And you know that Korea will be hosting a UNESCO World Education Conference in spring of the 2015. So what do you think about the, the agenda for po post-2015? particularly at the UNESCO conference in, in, in Korea in 2015, because that is very much important that because of the EFA and MDG education goals, as you might worry that the, 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 there are millions of literate uh, poor people in Africa, in other parts of the world, they will, if they will be united with the, 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 in, the, the complaining middle class, it will be a kind of bomb, I think. so. What would be your suggestion or your advice to the post-2015 agenda setting in education, particularly the, for the Korea conference? Thank you. Thank you. We'll take one more question. Please give microphone to you. OK. Um, <laughs> demography. You touched on it briefly, but it's huge. You're sitting in a country with the 
22% decline in youth population by 2025. Next door to another one in Japan with 28%, Russia is going to be 33, etc. Two consequences that relate middle class to labor markets to the reasons that people are here, namely aging populations, huge in those countries. So what are the occupationals, the occupation areas that are going to care for the aging populations? The whole range of health services and health professional practice organ, uh, occupations. The French Ministry of Santé is furious with the number of its health workers who are not certified. These are, and in the US we've got a nursing shortage. What the devil are you going to do at the short cycle degree level and at the first cycle degree level to fill those gaps? They're all middle class jobs. What are you going to do? There's a lot out there and that's what people here want to hear. Okay, we have to take one more question. Original microphone is going to the front, front row. Here. Okay, we'll take three questions and then answer. Uh, because my English is poor, I will question in Korea. Uh, one question. Now, Fukuyama 선생님이 중산층입니까? 아닙니까? 어느 층에 속하는지. 두 번째는 중산층에 대한 영향이 글로벌리제이션에 이 상당히 영향을 받을 것 같은데 그거에 대한 거하고 그 다음에 나머지 하나 또 간단한 질문입니다. 경제학자들이 실업 문제를 해결하기 위해서는 교육을 강조를 하는데 교육 강조가 실업 문제를 해결할 줄수 있는지 거기에 대해서 의견을 좀 듣고 싶습니다. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for those questions. Uh, I, I don't know about the planning of the agenda for the UNESCO conference. I uh, do know that in many parts of the developing world, uh, there's actually been a huge amount of progress in uh, expanding access to education. The region that I uh, travel to and know best is actually Latin America. And, and over the past 30, 40 years, uh, most of that continent has moved from a situation where only half of children had access to any education at all, uh, and, and now many of them are you know, over 90, well over 90 uh, percent. But the big problem, uh, and, and, and that's been happening in, in many parts of Africa as well, uh, the really, really big problem is, uh, is quality. Uh, and so there's, a, I think, a huge agenda now and, and the quality problem is much more difficult to solve because it's heavily you know, tied up with politics. Uh, you have a lot of entrenched uh, uh, stakeholders in educational systems that actually don't want the education system to improve very much. And how you deal with that kind of uh, set of questions, I think, uh, really needs to be on the agenda. Uh, again, with regard to this question of how do you deal with uh, health care for the aged, um, that's nothing, that's not a question that I uh, can have any particular expertise in. I do know that in the United States, if you look at projections for future uh, employment, there's this kind of bimodal distribution where you have a lot of very high-end jobs for statisticians and geneticists and engineers and software programmers. Uh, and then you have another uh, hump at the other end, and a lot of that hump is made up of, you know, people like home health care workers. These are low-skilled jobs that you cannot export uh, to other parts of the world. Uh, and that's going to be a huge employment category. And I think the problem in the United States is that we don't regard this, I mean, we just regard this as what you do if you can't get a job you know, doing something else. Uh, it's, it's not been professionalized. It's not you know, subject to you know, rigorous quality standards and training and uh, this sort of thing. I think the problem in Asia is um, possibly a different one, which is if you, the, you know, Japan, Korea, both are going to face this kind of problem down the road as well. The most obvious source of home health care or, uh, you know, health care workers taking care of aged people is immigration. But immigration raises a whole bunch of uh, really big political problems in, in uh, this part of the world. But I think you're going to have to deal with it uh, uh, eventually. 
uh, what class am I? Well, I'm middle class, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All Americans, no matter how much money they make, think that they're middle class because that's part of our national, uh, uh, that's part of our national um, uh, uh, mythology. But in fact, I do think that, you know, being middle class also does have to do with habits and expectations and, you know, the, the kind of, um, you know, the way that you relate to, to fellow citizens. And I think that there, despite the fact that, that objectively the, um, there's been more class stratification, uh, you know, there is still this belief, this fundamental American belief uh, in upward social mobility uh, which is, you know, very broadly shared, and I think it's part of American identity, and I hope that that um, uh, doesn't uh, disappear. Um, you know, I, I think I already touched a con on, on the question of how affluence will uh, is is affected by by globalization. Yeah. Okay, we have time a little bit more, so we, I will take two more questions. Please make one question for person, and that's gonna be we can go. Here. Yes. Those two persons. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fukuyama. Uh, I'm Ji Ho Kim, a private investor. Since you studied uh, classics at Cornell, I'm curious about what, what your views are regarding the similarities and differences between Rome and the United States. Rome and the United States? Yes. Okay. Especially regarding the future of the United States. Yeah, yeah please. In the front, front row, second row, here. After that, we'll take, uh, uh, we'll have a, a poll session. If somebody wants to take a poll with a uh, professor and come over to the floor, and then we take a picture together. Okay, go ahead. Chungju, Yeojung-e, Kumbana Kim Sung-gu입니다. 에, 여러 가지 얘기는 나왔는데요. 그 미래에 대한 구체적인 키워드는 언급을 하지 않아 주신 것 같습니다. 좀 개인이 좀더 행할 수 있는 키워드를 좀 저, 구체화시켜서 한 마디만 좀 해주셨으면 감사합니다. 오케이. Okay. Um. <웃음> Well, so I presume by asking this question about uh, Rome and the United States, the question is really, is the United States in uh, some kind of long-term political decline and will go the way of the Roman Empire? Uh, and I think that it is really very premature to argue that. Um, you know, a lot of uh, very unfortunate things have happened in the United States, like the government shutdown and this extreme degree of polarization that has disabled our government's ability to really make uh, big, important uh, decisions. Uh, but that, in a certain sense, uh, is a problem that may not be a permanent one. I think, you know, after a couple more election cycles, uh, the, the, you know, the system may look, um, uh, may look quite different, particularly if the Republicans keep doing things to shoot themselves in the foot, like you know, like trying to close the government. Um, and the strength of the United States has never been actually in strong, efficient government. In the United States, we had a terrible, low-quality, patronage-ridden uh, uh, national government, but we had a very strong private sector. And I think you're already, uh, you know, seeing evidence of the strength of that private sector, the whole shale gas revolution and, you know, the return of a lot of manufacturing, Silicon Valley still continues to be quite powerful. So I uh, would say that um, we are not Rome, and uh, you know, who knows in another 100 years where we'll be, but I, I wouldn't say on the basis of recent events that we're in that situation. The question is whether we can get our act together and you know, reverse the kinds of negative trends that we've seen. Well, I so on the question of the key, I, I thought my key word was the middle class. I mean, I think the middle class is the key to everything. Um, you know, I think it's the key to the health of democracies and to the spread of democracy, and I think it's the key, the, the health of the middle class is the key to the survival of democracies in uh, developed countries, in industrialized countries. Uh, so I think that's the, that's the word that I would leave with you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Fugama. And now it is time to close this session. I hope this session is as valuable and helpful to in designing your futures.
And it was a great honor to me to be with you and with your audience. Uh, let's give big hands to Professor Sukuyama.